Jay Coker, Mike Coulter, showrunner and star of Marvel's Luke Cage. I'm very excited to have you here. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. I, I'm, I'm the DJ, he's the rapper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, I'm so excited. Last we left you, you we didn't know what was going to happen with you next. And now you're getting your entire series. So we get to spend how many episodes with you? 13. 13 episodes. Wow. And how, where does it predominantly take place? Is it north? Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, what we like to call Upper Manhattan. It's uh, known otherwise known as Harlem. Uh, yeah, above Harlem starts what above 96th Street, I would say. Is that that kind of was that the demo, that's the uh, yeah, general ge geographic thing? I think 96th Street. We're a little farther up, but uh, yeah, it's in Harlem. So we're, we're like you know, actually our actual barber shop was um, was Lenox and 118th. So uh, it's it's funny because where we shot that same block was the block that was used in American Gangster. Oh wow. Um, the church that that we have in Luke Cage was the same church that Denzel got arrested in front of by Russell Crowe. The, you know, the, sh the block beyond the barbershop is the same block where Denzel shot Idris Elba. Oh, wow. Um, and just, just in terms of the barbershop, but we filmed all over Harlem and all over New York. And so that's the thing that, uh, that Jeff Loeb says is that the defenders are Daredevil, Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, Iron Fist, and the fifth defender is, of course, the city of New York, and trying to use the locations of New York as much as possible to give the, all the series their own flavor. And this is really the Harlem flavor. So um, I, I just can't, can't wait for um, people to see it. Yeah, Hell's Kitchen was really important to Daredevil. It was a guy just trying to clean up his corner. Yeah. How important is Harlem to Luke Cage? Um, I think Luke, Luke is, you know, um, I don't want to tell too much backstory, but, you know, he's not... He's not born and raised in Harlem in a sense. It's kind of an adopted home for him, and he's kind of taken on Harlem as a part of, you know, who he is. And they've they've accepted him, and he feels like he he owes it to them to to help them in their time of need. Um, he has a lot of connections to Harlem that you'll find out about in probably the first episode. Actually, you'll you'll see there's some relationships that you know that he has, and and who who he knows and how, how he knows them. And ultimately, you know, Harlem is just a place that he's come for refuge. You know, he, he left Hell's Kitchen because after what happened to Jessica, he needed a place to go and clear his head, literally, and to kind of like, you know, get things back in order and try and figure out what his next move is gonna be. So Harlem gave him that for a while. And then of course, as dramas, you know, as dramas do unfold, um, there's trouble in Harlem, so. <laughs> there's trouble in Harlem. Harlem paradise. Yeah, yeah, it was funny. <laughs> if you want to go with the black with the blaxploitation vibe hell up in Harlem the thing that's interesting is like Harlem has always been the nexus of um, music politics culture um, criminal figures I mean because if you look at Frank Lucas and Nicky Barnes and then at the same time you also have Adam Clayton Powell Malcolm X mm -hmm. um, you know you have the Cotton Club you have uh, Duke Ellington Count Basie I mean Muhammad Ali you know when he that very iconic moment when he and and Malcolm X you know right after he you know he won his first championship were in Harlem every place that you walk on the streets you're there's this history and so what was interesting about this was we had the opportunity to film there and you film and you feel that culture and that vibe and so we were able to use Harlem for Harlem Harlem is an evolving place it's changing yeah. so the gentrification of Harlem is something that became a topic in the show but at the same time the club that we created Harlem's Paradise really invokes the Cotton Club, it invokes the Lennox Lounge. It was really kind of a mix of all these different influences. And so really what it is, it's like, you know, um, the themes belong to the real world, the powers belong to Marvel, and you add some hip hop flavor into the mix. And it's something that ultimately is delicious. Now, those are three things I want to touch on. Last time I spoke to you, you were saying you had a lot of really exciting music that you were going to tie into this. Is yeah. there anyone you can tell us that is going to be a part of the Luke Cage series. Any cool yeah. soundtracks or new Oh, yeah. No. Adrian Young and Ali yeah. Shahid, you know, um, Muhammad, those guys. We, I couldn't say those names at the time we spoke earlier because, yeah, they were on this show. Yeah, they had visited set. Yeah, they were working on the, on, the, on the music, but we couldn't release the information. So those are two people that were instrumental in creating the soundtrack. But then we have others like, you know, Faith. You know. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, Adrian Young and Ali Shahid Muhammad in terms of the score, you know, we had a 30-piece orchestra. And so, which is, we, we, we live scored the entire series, uh, or the, you know, and that was the thing that, all, that, because people don't really do that anymore, it gives it a certain breath, I mean, like it really invokes Isaac Hayes and it invokes, you know, Curtis Mayfield, but does it in its own way that has its own special hip hop flavor. Not only what Adrian does in terms of having 
always using analog recording and real, you know, instruments. But uh, but even Ali Shahid Muhammad, of course, being one of the architects of a tribe called Quest. And so we have that vibe. But then in terms of actually on camera appearances, we have everyone from Faith Evans and Raphael Sadiq to um, Charles Bradley to the Delphonics. Um, Method Man, I mean, we, we, we you know, J um, Jadena, I mean, we've got some really great performances. And so it's kind of this mixture of music matched with action. Um, there's not a dull moment the entire, se you know, season. And I can't wait. I mean, the excitement is just so palpable with this show. I mean, I, I can't wait for the 30th. It's, you know, September 30th can't come soon enough. Well, speaking of action, is there going to be an incitement moment for your character? Because when we left him, he was a reluctant superhero. He didn't want us. He didn't want the limelight. He yeah. didn't want to fight crime. Yeah, I, definitely. I think there's a there's a couple moments um, where he has to deal with this this idea that he's running from his past, but yet he's needed here in the present to be someone that he innately is, but he doesn't want to own up to. And I think you know there's a certain episode where you know he just you know. If it clicks in a sense, you know, he just faces the music. It's like, I, I have to own this and I have to, you know, I have to be the man that I am or at least the man that people think that I am and I have to live in this space because I'm in Harlem. I can't go anywhere. I don't have a mask and people know where I am. They know how to reach me. Um, that's that's going to become a, a very interesting situation and something that will play out throughout the series. Him dealing with his local celebrity, as it were, and and dealing with the people that need him and how he solves problems and all the all the responsibility that comes on his shoulders from doing that because as soon as, as soon as like he said, you know, Jessica, you know, you have a target in your back or they're coming out after you with a noose for around your neck. They're, they're either they're either hunting you because you're a freak, or be, or or they or they want a piece of you, and so that's what he he stepped into. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to deal with that. But now you know he's turned up the heat, you know, and it's going to happen. You, it, first, it doesn't happen slowly, but it, it happens organically and naturally, and, and and with just cause. And that's the thing about Luke is that he's somebody that is kind of in the shadows, laying in the cut, staying off the grid. And when a very small incident happens that he observes in episode one, he doesn't do anything about it. And the consequences to, of this little effect come back in a big way in the second episode and really force him to accept the fact that he has these powers and now it really propels him to action. Um, so the thing is, it's really, really, you know, um, I would say a theme that we explore throughout the entire first season, which is what compels someone to be a hero? Because being a hero can be such a thankless job. How does it, how do, people that become heroes, what are the sacrifices? And despite all these sacrifices, what makes ultimately somebody accept this mantle of power and responsibility and move forward? And um, the one thing about these 13 episodes is we managed to do that. We also managed to be very topical in terms of what's happening today. And then at the same time, we have music and it's, you know, there's a kind of fun and a lightness to it. I mean, even though we deal with some very deep drama, like it doesn't overwhelm the show to the point where you don't want to watch it. I mean, it, it's really kind of, it, you know, a microcosm of what's happening today, but at the same time is also melded with, you know, Marvel flavor. So it's, it's really a great dynamic mix and I'm, something that I'm incredibly proud of. Bouncing off of that, you said that the themes are real life. I mean, this is the first black title character in the Marvel Universe since they rebooted in 2008 on television or in film. How much is what's resonating in society right now going to be important with Luke Cage? Is it going to be important? It's, it's something that we have to deal with. It's timely, like, you know, Chael referred to, uh, spoke about it earlier. You know, this was in the making two years ago or not sooner, later, earlier than that. And, you know, the scripts were written, you know, a long time ago. It wasn't, you know, things, this has been going on for a long time in society, so we're dealing with it. It is, it is timely. It is something that people can relate to today. But at the same time, you know, yeah, he's a bulletproof character in a world that seems to have, you know, focused on black people in a way that, you know, people were not aware of before. And so how does that play to the people when they're watching it? It's going to have a significance. There's no way around that. Um, but like Chael said, I think there's an optimism about this character. There's an, there's an optimism and, and, a, and a very conscientious, um, thoughtful character that we're creating that I think ultimately 
it, it doesn't get to the point where it's so heavy that it depresses you. It only uplifts you, and I think it makes you feel like there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and that, and that there is some place that we're going as a society and as a culture. And it's not just about Harlem; it's about people, how they respond. And Luke is trying to, you know, influence the community. He wants people to be their own heroes because ultimately, everything we do is not about picking up a car and throwing it through a building or, 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 or helping someone. Heroic acts happen every day, and most of the times, the biggest heroic acts happen on a small level, you know, in our everyday life. And so that's the kind of thing that we're trying to inspire because it takes a lot of courage sometimes just to say something or to speak you know because you're not going to it's not going to be met with um with acceptance sometimes you just keep silent because you're afraid you know lucas kept silent for a long time because he's afraid of who he is what his past was he has to deal with that so in doing that i think that shows a lot of um of heroic traits and so that that is what he's trying to pass on to the community well, there was a moment, I remember we were in a production meeting, and um, we were talking about a sequence in which, you know, Luke was going to get shot at a number of times. And because of the fact that the character, Luke Cage, has impenetrable skin and super strength, um, it was funny, Jeff Loeb actually said, you know, I don't want it to come off like one of those, you know, um, George Reeves, Superman things like what that happened when I was a kid where, you know, the guy pulls up the pop gun and, 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 you know, because the audience knows that this isn't going to affect him, there's no drama. And I said, Jeff, I will never get tired of seeing a bulletproof black man. So <laughs> the thing is, is that like, because of in light of what's happening today and all these things that are happening, it's like, we didn't mean to necessarily be topical, but we didn't run away from it. You know, because these things that are happening, you know, have been happening for a long time. The only difference now is that people have cameras, a camera crew in their pocket yeah. and they can capture these things. And so we're not shying away from the politics. We're not shying away from the culture. But at the same time, we also have a hero who is born for these times. And so we wanted to do it in a way that. We could definitely, and you will see over the 13 episodes, we deal with a lot of issues, but we're not so overwhelmed by those issues that you lose sight of the source of, you know, where the show comes from, because it comes from comic books. And the thing that Marvel, more than anything, that, you know, I, and this is me just being a fanboy and a geek, you know, from, you know, I'm 43 years old, I've been reading comic books since the time I was 12. I mean... Comic books have always, particularly Marvel comic books, have always dealt with deep societal themes in ways that were entertaining and pertained particularly to the Marvel Universe, but were basically universal outside. So for a perfect example, it's like I was, my, one of my biggest influences was the graphic novel God Love, Man Kills. And also another one that I loved was the, um, the Chris Claremont, Frank Miller mm -hmm. for issue, you know, mini of Wolverine. Um, which actually in my office is hanging up. The thing about those comics when I read those when I was younger was that, man, I didn't know a comic could get this deep. Right. And that's the thing about this show is that, yes, this show comes from, you know, a comic book company, but at the same time we get so deep with what we deal with that, you know, you can go that deep. Right. And that's the thing is that what's great is that it isn't that these shows aspire above Marvel Comics. It's just that you finally have in the television and film medium, they're finally taking itself as seriously as the comics always have. Right. And so it's really just a continuum and just, you know, it's just that the pain is electric in this case. Taking themselves as seriously as the comics always have. That's really interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. I could talk about this much longer and I hopefully we'll, we'll get that chance. But thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Well, talking about Luke Cage. Thank you, thank Meredith. You so appreciate it.